Let's get into it. 2024, yeah. I have no doubt, the ANC is not going to get the majority. 50%, forget it. Hmm. South Africans are angry. You know, in South Africa, there are yeah. no standards. You can wake up, you are a thug, um, you are a convicted criminal, you are a Kenny Kune. And because you no longer, you've run out of money, you set up a party. South Africans are so gullible that such thugs, such convicted criminals, then get voted into power. Starting with Mandela, by the way, each one of the ANC presidents since 1994 have actually contributed to producing the mess that we are in. Instead of Operation Dudula, targeting foreigners, it's supposed to go to the union buildings and say, hey, our government, why are you failing to manage the entry and exit of foreigners in South Africa? This is the man who promised us a new dawn when he was elected president of the ANC in 2017 and when he became our state president in 2018. Have you ever seen that new dawn? They threatened me. I was shown a file years ago, an intelligence file. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, a very thick intelligence file uh, where spies were sent to my village. Spread the fire. Welcome back to SMWX. There is so much happening in our country right now. Stage six, crisis to crisis. The state of the nation address. My goodness, since we last spoke, we had the EFF being violently ejected from parliament. The president announcing a minister of electricity. Violent crime running rampant. So there's a lot to discuss. And in a recent short video, you overwhelmingly begged for me to finally bring Prince Mashele onto SMWX, an author, a public intellectual, and one of our country's most incisive political analysts who has been making politicians run for many a long year. Um, thank you so much for joining us on SMWX. It's a true honor to have you. Thank you, Caesar, for inviting me. In the President's State of the Nation Address, which was in early February, he announced a Minister of Electricity as his big signature move to try and stem the tide of this electricity uh, crisis. What do you think of that announcement? <clears throat> it, it was an attempt to fool South Africans. Um, the, the message that he wants to convey is that this new Minister of Electricity is going to solve our elect electricity problems. Um, the, the assumption is that we are where we are in terms of blackouts because there was no Minister of Electricity in Cabinet. <coughs> That's total nonsense. There were two ministers in cabinet responsible for ESCOM, the Minister of Energy and the Minister of Public Enterprises. If two ministers couldn't solve the problem of ESCOM, what makes you think one minister can solve our electricity problems? That's the starting point. So South Africans must not be fooled. Uh, this is a gimmick. It's not going to solve South Africa's problems. Let me take you a, a bit back, mm. because a lot of the discussion around uh, our electri electricity problems and ESCOM yeah. is ahistorical. People don't know where this ESCOM thing comes from and how we got where we are. There was a period in the history of this country when South Africa was in the dark. In other words, there was not a single public entity that was providing electricity to the rest of the country. The only parts of South Africa that had electricity were those where there were economic activities such as mining here in Johannesburg, for example. And if you look at who at the time was providing electricity, it was actually the private sector, 
there was a company called the Victoria Falls Power Company, which was co-owned by Cecil John Rhodes. Mm. That system of a private sector-based electricity provision mm. did not work for the entire country. So the government of the day, and I recall it was actually the government of Jan Smarts in, in 1990, took a decision that, look, we need one entity that is going to provide electricity to the rest of the country, including parts that were not producing um, economic goods such as mining. Mm. So that's how ESCOM was introduced. Now, when ESCOM was introduced, the politicians of the time understood that you don't need a politician to run such a power company. You need an engineer, you need scientists. So they called an engineer who happened to be South African, who had studied in Germany, who was practicing science in the US, a, a, a man by the name of Hendrik van der Beyl. This is the man who set up ESCOM. What did he do? He brought his friends from all over the world, from the US and from Germany, who were engineers who set up ESCOM. And throughout the tenure of this person, ESCOM never had problems. By the way, ESCOM generated money. It paid government for the loan it had given to set up the, 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 the company. Fast forward to post-1994. Even from 1994 all the way to about 2000, yeah. ESCOM was run by experts and we never had these problems. And by the way, the board and the management of ESCOM around 1997 warned the government of the day, which is the government of the ANC, that 15 years later there would be darkness in South Africa, there would be load shedding. And what did the ANC government do? Nothing. They did not invest in the electricity generation capacity of ESCOM. That's how we are here. So to get out of here, you don't need a minister of electricity. You need engineers who must fix ESCOM and reimagine ESCOM in order for us to get rid of our load trading. So don't, don't, don't invest a lot in the statement made by the president. It's been a presidency of many PR stunts, quite frankly. But I think what the Ramaphosa administration has been at pains to say, and their line on this seems to, to me to be, and, and they would say to you, well, look, we inherited this mess from our predecessor. Uh, we're trying our best. We've appointed the right people and give us some time and this will all be over soon. What do you say to that line of reasoning that in fact what we're dealing with here is, is not the fault of the current administration but it's the fault of the previous administration? Precisely the problem with South Africans. You see, never make the mistake of separating one ANC president from another. If you do that, you are going to chase your own tail and your own shadow, and you're not going to, you're not going to catch it. <laughs> In order to understand where South Africa is today, mm. you must understand the country as an entity that has been run by the ANC from 1994 to 2023. And then you will ask the question, what does the record of this ANC look like over the past 28, 29 years, right? So this idea that let us not, let us absolve Ramaphosa. These are problems created by Zuma. Even Zuma, by the way, makes the same argument. It's not my problem. The problem is the Tabumbeke administration. Mm. We are made to chase our own tails. The fact of the matter is that we are in this mess because of the ANC government that has been in charge of South Africa since 1994. By the way, even if you were to take a needle and try and trace the evolution of the ANC government, you will find that starting with Mandela, by the way, each one of the ANC presidents since 1994 have actually contributed to producing the mess that we are in. When ESCOM advised the government of the day in 1997, that that government should invest in electric generation. The president of South Africa at the time was Nelson Mandela. So even Mandela has something to, 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 to take responsibility for. He did not invest. Tabo Mbeki also, he did not invest. Zuma did not invest. Ramaphosa did not invest. So don't make us chase our tails. It is the ANC government as a whole 
including Ramaphosa. In fact, by the way, Ramaphosa has a lot to answer for because for five years, he was chairperson of a thing called War Room on ESCOM, appointed by the then president, Jacob Zuma. What has that war room produced? It actually intensified our problems. It hasn't solved the problem. And, and this is the context in which the president comes before the nation. He gives this big speech. And in many ways, when I watched that speech, it was kind of like the death knell for Ramaphoria. I thought back to 2018 when the president was able to sweep the nation away with this speech that was talking about how we were about to, to enter a new era for our country, something that would be fundamentally different. And then suddenly it felt like no one was listening. No one was even prepared to buy into any of the promises because we've seen where we are. On the other hand, we also had our customary annual commotion in Parliament, which ended up in a violent um, ejection of the EFF from, from the chamber. What, what are your thoughts on that moment and what it represents for where we are now as a country? There are two issues here. <coughs> there is the, the substance of the state of the nation address, and then there is the chaos uh, linked to the EFF. And, and we need to deal with these two separately. Let me f deal with the substance first. Sure. You see, uh, Einstein said the definition of stupidity is to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results, close quote. Now, if anybody were to listen to President Ramaphosa's promises in 2023, and expect different results. Such a person would be a stupid person, according to Einstein's definition. Because this is the man who promised us a new dawn when he was elected president of the ANC in 2017 and when he became our state president in 2018. Have you ever seen that new dawn? Is there any South African anywhere in South Africa who has seen that new dawn? Let me tell you, I travel across the country. Mm. There is nothing called a new dawn in South Africa. Mm. Whether you are in the Eastern Cape, I was there two weeks ago. Whether you are in Bush Park Ridge in Bumalanga, where I was born, I was there a month or so ago. Whether you are in Haute, this is what we are going to see. Potholes all over, which is a sign of a collapse of the state under Ramaphosa. Mm. Number two, lot shedding, blackouts all over. Ramaphosa has done nothing to turn that around. Criminality is rampant, rampant in South Africa. People are being killed left, right, and center. I mean, uh, AKA was shot. Mm. But now we've seen that. Yeah. Uh, education is a mess. So if you take the critical pillars of a functioning modern state, Ramaphosa hasn't touched them over the past five years. So it would be a big mistake for anybody to take Ramaphosa very seriously. The last point I want to make with regard to the substance of the state of the national address is mm, that mm. Ramaphosa has squandered his own credibility. I mean, if you recall the drama around Palapala, right? Mm. You know, when Ramaphosa became our president, he projected this image of a holier than thou, yeah. you know, leader. In other words, someone who was better than Zuma. Zuma was corrupt, Ramaphosa was clean. That's sure. the choreographed image we were fed, right? Absolutely. But of course, some of us dismissed that nonsense. Mm. And we were lone voices. And of course, yeah. we were told to, you yeah. know, we were said to hate the ANC mm. and not to give Ramaphosa a chance and all of that nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. Look, it doesn't matter what uh, people in the ANC do. South Africans know that what happened in Palapala is wrong, is unlawful, it's criminal, and it's corrupt. Hmm. So, and this is the farm of the president. So if the farm of the president is the scene of that kind of crime, why must South Africans take him seriously when he stands before us in parliament and promises that he's going to fix our country? Mm -hmm. So the man has no credibility left whatsoever. So that's the first part. Sure. The second part is the EFF. Mm -hmm. You see, the, the EFF are, are an expression of a deep crisis in the country. And, and we need to analyze the EFF very thoroughly in order to understand what they represent. The EFF represent a segment of our population 
in the main, that segment of population is young, black, uneducated, hopeless, and unemployed and unemployable. These are people who live in informal settlements. These are people you find in Gauteng in the main concentrated around Deep Sloot, around Alexandra and other parts of Zanspreit and other parts of Gauteng. These are young people who come from different parts of South Africa, hoping that they would find a job in Gauteng. And this phenomenon, by the way, you also find in, in, the, in the migratory uh, process from sure. the Eastern Cape to the Western Cape, right? That's what the EFF represents. It represents that, that segment of our population that is hopeless. But the problem with that segment of our population, by the way, it's, it's actually extremely dangerous for the stability of our country. If not well managed, that, pop, that segment can destroy our country because sure. it doesn't have a stake in whatever little works in South Africa. So the EFF leadership has understood that it represents that. So what they do, they express that kind of hopelessness in parliament. To be honest, that kind of drama in a modern civilized society, democracy, should be unacceptable. I am not proud to see that kind of chaos as a South African sure. in my parliament. Because younger South Africans who want to be politicians, they now see that as politics. That's not politics, that's chaos. So, so, so my, my judgment with regard to what the EFF is doing in parliament is that they are actually destroying our democracy. Tell me in future, what would make it, um, what would make it scary for younger South Africans to stand in parliament and cause chaos? Because the EFF now has said the president that you can go into parliament and, and cause disorder. So, so that's my, that's my, my view that uh, Ramaphosa is a dis huge disappointment, but the EFF in terms of what they're doing in parliament, they are shaking the roots of our democracy. Sure, and I think as an analyst, you've been interesting to the extent that you've been very hard on both opposition parties and the ANC, and we often don't see that. People often pick and choose who they, who they take to task. On that question, I think in some ways I, I hear you to the extent that the strategy of parliamentary disruption may well have a sell-by date. And while I think it was very effective in the Zuma years, there is an extent to which public opinion has in some ways shifted away from these kind of parliamentary disruptions. But I also do think that we, we shouldn't lose the, the violence of the state response um, within the parliamentary chamber as well. And I think that's a, a second parallel question for us. Mm -hmm. Because it's the EFF today and you know, the EFF is a relatively small party and it's, it's easy to, to victimize them and, and, and demonize them. But something doesn't sit right with me when I see, whether you agree with the EFF strategy or not, when I see the kind of militant protection of, of this mediocre place that we're in. You know. I, I hear you, sure, I hear you. Sure. Look, we are... Where we are as a country, in other words, we are in this mess not because of the EFF. Yeah. Place sure. that on record. Sure. And even the DA, let's uh, be honest. Yeah, yeah. not yeah. because of the DA. Sure. Sure. We are in this mess because of the African National mm. Congress, mm. because mm. of their mismanagement of the country. Yeah. They are the ones who broke all our institutions sure. that are supposed to undergird our political stability. Mm. So, so, so we shouldn't watch the circus in parliament and think that has got nothing to do with the ANC. Mm. Those ANC parliamentarians who sit there as if they are dignified ladies and gentlemen, they are responsible for the chaos we see right there um, on the floor of our house. So we, we've got to connect that. Sure. Even if, by the way, you want to be um, technical, I mean, let's be honest about it. The leadership of the EFF comes from the ANC. Sure. So that chaos has got to do with the African National Congress. Having said that, mm. we, should not, um, we should not lose sight of the need to restore dignified politics um, as, a, as a beacon of our democracy. 
we, we've got to have a decent discussion about what is proper and what is improper. Sure. sure. So, so I'm not, I'm not criticizing the EFF uh, because I dislike the EFF. Mm, sure. Even if it, it were another party, I would be as critical as I am yeah. because the point I'm trying to make is that our country has been broken by the ANC. What we see, the chaos we see in parliament is a symptom and a manifestation of that. Mm. We shouldn't celebrate it. We should go back to the drawing board and say, how do we do proper politics that is dignified? That's yeah. the point I'm trying to make. And, and I hear you on that. And I think one of the, one of the things that is actually disappointing me about parliament, but also politics in general right now is we spoke uh, earlier about countries that have actually lifted themselves out of the kind of crisis that we're facing. And other co countries have done it in East Asia and Latin America and Scandinavia. Even in, in Africa, we, we see various countries um, you know, moving forward, becoming dynamic and, and breaking through generations of, of poverty and, and landlessness. So it has been mm -hmm. done before. But in those places, places like Parliament become places where there are serious debates about what is the, the right economic trajectory? You know, how do we do something new that's never been done before in terms of economic policy where we, we keep the stability of our economy but we, we make it more redistributed and fair at the same time? Mm -hmm. And when I look at our parliament, whether we talk about disruption or whether we talk about the President's State of the Nation address or whether we just talk about the level of debate, I don't feel that anyone has actually proposed something new something fundamentally different that people can believe in that 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 is about a debate about how do we get ourselves out of this it just feels like either it's a boring promise or it's someone protesting against a boring promise but nobody's giving us an alternative to that boring promise mm. <coughs> here is the problem the problem is that um in south africa and south africans um, all of us must take responsibility for the political outcomes that mm. we, we, we have. We have entrusted the one party, the African National Congress, since 1994, with the responsibility to govern our country. Without us posing and, and evaluating if this party is taking us in the right direction or not. Mm. If we had paused, I think by now, the ANC uh, wouldn't be the government of South Africa because if you look at the crimes that the ANC has committed against the people of South Africa, they are unforgivable. They have literally broken the back of our state. So that's the first thing. So yeah. if you have a party that has been in power for almost 30 years, you are going to get to a point where it becomes stale. That party becomes stale. In other words, there is nothing that the ANC will tell you that it hasn't told you over the past 30, 30 years. So that's why, as the leader of society and as the leader of public politics and discourse, it sets the tone. And the tone that comes out of our politics is that we are moving around the same circle. Mm. It's because we've had, we had the same bunch of people who have been in parliament for the longest time. Mm. I mean, you, you had people like Nkosa and Lamini Zuma, right? Yeah. Yeah. Who, were, who were in their... 30s in 1994, sitting right there in parliament. They are now in, the, in, their, in their 60s, right? Mm. Many so, in their 70s. Many in their 70s. They were there when they were young. Mm. So don't expect anything new. That's number one. Sure. Number two, and it's related to the first point, mm. is that South Africa hasn't paid, South Africans haven't paid attention to standards. You know, in South Africa, there are yeah. no standards. You can wake up, you are a thug. Um, you are a convicted criminal, you are a kenikunen, right? Let's be blunt about it. Convicted criminal. And because you no longer, you've run out of money, you set up a party, uh, you call it a, a patriotic alliance. Mm. South Africans are so gullible that such thugs, such convicted criminals, then get voted into power. What do you expect when these uh, criminals are in power? They are going to loot, right? So we don't, we don't have standards. Um, in the countries where you refer to, mm -hmm. uh, take 
South Korea, take Singapore, take even China, by the way. Sure. There, if you are not educated, you won't be in cabinet. Bottom line. Uh, there, if you are corrupt, uh, in China they murder you, literally. Right? Or in South Korea, they jail you. I mean, in, the South Koreans have jailed former presidents. Right? But in South Africa, we don't do that. So until, as South Africans, we have a civilized debate about the need to have standards in our politics that a convicted criminal like Kenu Kunene cannot stand for office. And an educated person cannot stand for office. Because the business of governance is a very complicated business. It requires education. I mean, you didn't go to school for nothing, Sisu. I mean, if we took someone who has never been to school to sit in your chair, I don't think this interview would, would actually be as orderly and as coherent as it has been going. So we've got to be honest with ourselves. If we are not, we are going to self-destruct as a, as a society. Yeah, I think certainly there's, there's a need for us to rethink a lot of the assumptions under which we've been working as a country. It feels like we've reached a point where the playbook that worked to get us out of the crisis of the late 1980s is, is just falling on deaf ears and, and not actually delivering. And I wonder, I mean, you've, you've proposed some changes around questions of how we appoint and who we appoint. But you've also, in a, in a recent article, spoken about an entire second transition. Mm. So we should think about the first transition as that, that moment where we came out of apartheid and moved into the, the constitutional order. And now we need something as fundamental. Talk us through this idea of a second transition and, and what you think 2024 represents in terms of the, the political life of, of our country. That's a very important question you're asking. <clears throat> you see, why do I call this a second transition? It's because the first transition was in 1994. What is a transition in politics? In political science, it's called a, re a realignment moment. Uh, what are the characteristics? Number one, you see a fundamental decline of a hegemonic force that used to hold society together and it declines. And the manifestation, manifestations of that include the loss of control by that hegemonic force over the state. We saw that before 1994. The National Party, when it was crumbling, it lost control over the state. Number three, a realignment moment is characterized by a sense of um, anxiety about the future. Typically, there would be lack of clarity as to what the future would look like. So in 1994, even as most of us were excited that the ANS was going to take over as the new government, there was anxiety in society as to what the new South Africa would look like. So if you take these three elements, you see them now today. Number one, the ANC has lost control over the South African state. There's no question about it. That's why potholes, that's why education, that's why crime. So, the hegemonic force that held us together, which is the ANC, has totally lost control of society. Number two, um, there is uncertainty about the future. As you and I speak here, South Africans are wondering what does the future of our children look like? Who is going to be in charge of South Africa? That tells you that you are witnessing a second transition. So what happened during the, the first transition? When there is a transition, groups of the elite in society, they have secret talks about managing that transition and constructing a new order. That happened mm. in, the, in the 1990s, right? My worry is that as we speak, there are no such talks about managing this transition and about constructing a new order. I'm not aware of the elite um, convening, in, at least in the fashion that we saw them before 1994, mm. to talk seriously about how do we manage this transition and what kind of a new order do we, do we need to put in place. So I am very worried that we are likely to drift unguided as a society. Mm. 
because it seems like there is no one in society who's taking responsibility for managing the transition and fashioning a new a, a new order. So that's 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 my my reading. But 2024, yeah. I have no doubt, the ANC is not going to get the majority. 50 percent, forget it. Hmm. South Africans are angry. We are going to have a coalition government after 2024. And I can tell you the scenarios. Scenario number one is yeah. either the ANC and the EFF. Mm. And we can see the EFF and the ANC trying to experiment with that kind of scenario, by the way. In Johannesburg, what sure. is happening now? Sure. Ekuruleni and so on. They're trying to test waters. Mm. Mm. Or you are going to have the ANC and the DA. The so-called Grand Coalition. Ex exactly. You could possibly have that. Mm. The mayor of Cape Town. I saw that, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, uh, and Helen Zille, by the way, yeah. Yeah, previously. Exactly. As well. So they are toying, be, toying yeah. with, that, with, yeah. the, with, with that idea. Yeah. And here, here is the interesting um, element. Both the DA and, mm. the, and, the, and the EFF actually are imagining the same thing. They both can see the ANC mm. is collapsing. They want the ANC to collapse into them. Mm. So the EFF wants the ANC to collapse into the EFF so that the EFF emerges as the leader of South Africa. The DA wants to do the same. Sure. So there is actually a very strange competition for the ANC mm. by mm. Smaller, smaller parties. Mm. The second scenario is a coalition of former opposing parties. Sure. That the is third, the, D, the third, the third yeah. sorry, yeah. the DA. Action SA, even the EFF could yeah. be part of yeah, it. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, the IFP in mm. KwaZulu Natal will grow. So that th those are the scenarios. But yeah. one thing for sure, our country is going to see something we haven't seen since 1994. Yeah. No, and I think those scenarios are really interesting. For me, I think I'm I'm tempted towards an opposition coalition scenario, and the reason for that is. Based on what you've already said, until we as a country send the message that you can actually lose power if you lose power and if, if you break your promises, there are consequences. I don't know if we'll ever get to the stage of being able to craft alternatives. So, for, and, and I'm not saying that I think an opposition coalition would necessarily govern mm. well. Um, but the, the choice is between a government that doesn't govern well without accountability, and maybe one that doesn't govern well, at least with the message of accountability. And in those imperfect scenarios, I think we need to start thinking about what an opposition coalition would look like. Now, the DA and the EFF have obviously, and, and you said this in your article too, in public played like the best of enemies. But, you know, we've looked at international examples in this conversation, and some coalitions actually come together when you bring two extremes and you bring them to the table and you say, well, look, what can these two extremes at least agree on? You know, the DA must keep the EFF honest on governance and the EFF must keep the DA honest on questions of racial justice and, and transformation. Could that be an outlier scenario? I think, I think people have explored the ANC-EFF coalition, they've explored the, the DA-ANC coalition, but less attention has been given to this possible Opposition coalition, Action SA, would obviously also feature there. <clears throat> Look, I'm a student of democratic theory. Mm. And let's be honest about it. Um, democracy has sustained itself the longest, mainly in Western societies. It's just a fact, whether we like it or not. Okay. In Western Europe and North America, to be specific. Mm. What is sustained democracy? Elsewhere, experiments were made in South America, even in Africa, and democracies collapsed. What is sustained democracy in Western Europe and North America? Mm. Is this idea that the electorate all the time can make an assessment in terms of the performance of the governing party, mm. and the electorate can remove it and put in power a new party? So in a society where that dynamic, that principle mm. is at work, that society is better place to sustain democracy. Sure. So let me be honest. If the ANC were to be removed from power in 2024, I would be, um, I would be among the happiest in South Africa. I don't question <laughs> about it. I don't <laughs> mince my way. Because that would mean mm. that as South Africans, our democracy is maturing. Mm. We can remove one party and replace it with another. Sure. That's the first thing. Mm. 
then the second aspect of your question has got to do with co-governing yeah. yeah. amongst opposing parties. Mm. I agree with your theory, by the way. Hmm. <clears throat> so, the reason why the ANC got us where we are is mm. because the fact that you had one party of the same comrades, they could sit in the same boardroom mm. where you and I as voters are not there mm. and agree to swindle us as South Africans. Started with the arms deal and agreed that mm, we are going to steal man, uh, comrades. And uh, uh, no one must tell anyone after this, right? Mm. One part, there was no other party in that boardroom. Mm. If you look at state capture, that's precisely how we got here. The deployment um, committee of the ANC. Same bunch of people, say comrades, we're going to deploy so and so mm. in that position. Mm. So you need to disturb that arrangement in that boardroom of power. Yeah. Where you have others who are not comrades. When a group says, comrades, let's steal. You need another group says, ah, we are not going to allow theft. Mm. So if you were to bring together the DA, the EFF, Action SA, the IFP, these parties would never agree to steal together. That's number one. So it means that you would have someone in that boardroom who's going to say, ah, no, we're not stealing. Number two, say you're looking for a job in such a municipality. You are a South African qualified, beautiful CV. Mm. You stand a better chance of finding a job in an arrangement where there are many parties than in an arrangement where there is one party. Mm. Yeah, so sure. in the Western Cape, for example, if the DA wanted to do it, they can decide, sit in that boardroom and say, we are going to appoint yeah. people who are aligned to the DA. What are they going to do? They have a majority. Mm. They can close and lock the door and take such a, 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 a position. It would be dangerous for, for us as South Africans if one party can take such a decision. So yeah. I prefer a situation where the, the boardroom of power mm. has many voices yeah. um, to represent the diversity of South Africa. By the way, if you want a practical example, I can give you uh, an example, the example of Johannesburg under Mashaba. Mm. Right? Mm. Sure. The sky didn't fall. The, the sky didn't mm. fall. Mm. And despite the noises, by the way, yeah, yeah. it was the most stable coalition government for three years. And what you had was you had the, the EFF saying to the DA, no, listen, you have to insource. Exactly. So come a little bit. But then the DA also saying, hold on, we're going to govern like we govern in other places. And I agree. Look, yeah, it, it, it worked for the yeah, residents yeah, of Johannesburg yeah, yeah. until the DA decided to do what they did. Mm. No, it's a fascinating one. I'll, I'll add another scenario to, to yours, which is um, some kind of national unity um, agreement. And one thing I've been thinking of and, and what we've also spoken about on this channel, we spoke to uh, Bongani Baloi of Action SA, the Gauteng leader. And there's also a possibility of power sharing across the, the different um, arms of government. So what you could have is an ANC DA coalition in the executive and an EFF Action SA or something coalition in the legislature. So you, you could also see these kind of power sharing agreements in different spheres of, of authority. So imagine, for example, uh, the ANC and the DA said, OK, um, to the EFF, why don't you take parliament if you're so interested in, in what happens here? Let's see if you can run it. And then suddenly the EFF now would have to hold the executive accountable. So we could also see these kinds of creative ways of sharing power that we've never seen before if the ANC does lose that, that majority. I, I actually don't think so. I'll tell you why. You see, a coalition, a coalition at an executive level wouldn't be possible um, if such a deal doesn't include parliament. It wouldn't be possible. Uh, the calculations are going to be based on numbers. In other words, what have you got from the elections? Sure. So the parties that will come together will come together on the basis of their parliamentary strength. Because remember, the South African political system is a parliamentary democracy. So you can constitute an executive if you can't be voted as president of South Africa in parliament. Uh, so e the executive and parliament are... Systemic, systemically tied together. 
So, so if the EFF goes with the DAA, Action SA, IFP, they will have to do that on the basis of their numbers in parliament because they will have to vote their own president who is going to appoint the executive. And if the EFF goes with the ANC, the same will apply. They will have to have enough numbers in parliament to be able to impose their political deal. So I don't think um, that is a likely scenario. The, scenar the aspect of the scenarios that might happen, it's provincial power sharing. Sure. Where you have, for example, in Gauteng, uh, Action SA in a coalition with the EFF and the DA, right? Um, if the ANC, for example, were to be in a coalition with the IFP, say the e ANC gets 49%, um, they could easily talk to the IFP with 4%, yeah, sure. possibly, and say, let's call govern. Mm. But and then the, EF, the IFP being given executive positions, minister of this, minister of that. Sure, sure. Without the ANC and the IFP being able to control a province like Gauteng. Mm. So you could have that, where the, IF, the EFF, DA and the Action SA run one province. So that is, scenario is, is, is likely. Yeah, absolutely. No, there's spheres, there are provinces, yeah. there's, so ma there's so many different opportunities for these permutations to play themselves out. And it's going to be like nothing we've seen before, I suspect. We are lucky and unlucky, by mm. the way, at the mm. same time, because you see, I voted in 1994, you know, I was 18 in 1994. Wow. Yeah. So when I registered for matric in 1994, my president in January was an apartheid president, mm. Ditlek. When I wrote exam in October, mm. my president was a democratically elected president, Nelson Mandela. Mm. So my generation it, it was very lucky to straddle those, those lands, yeah. lanes. But that, in my lifetime, I have seen the ANC rising and falling. Mm. And that in 2024, most probably, the ANC won't be the government of South Africa. It means that we are lucky yeah. or unlucky. Can we also explore this grand coalition? Because as you identified, I've also seen DA leaders starting to float this idea of, no, look, we've got to keep the EFF out. So the, the least worst option in 2024 is let's come together with the ANC. That would be a staggering moment in South African history for these two parties that have always painted themselves as, as opposing poles to come together. But I also, I'm just, I'm not filled with excitement about the prospect because just as you say about the way that parliament and, and the executive are intertwined, what happens to parliamentary accountability functions when the government now has an 80% majority in parliament and parliament can just, you know, if we thought that parliament was a rubber stamping body before, can you imagine when the ANC and the DA, you know, are, are governing? So I'm interested in your thoughts on, mm. on this because mm. I, I, I mean, look, it's the, it's the one, it's the option that probably gives us the most stability. ANC, DA come together, the coalition can be stable. Uh, you won't have things that are happening in Joburg happening. And sure, there's stability. But the, the reverse side of that is also a lack of accountability if you have a government with, with such a large majority. Look, you, you are absolute, absolutely right in terms of lack of accountability. But there's a, a part that you must not miss. It would not be the first time that we have a, a cat and a mice, mouse. Sure. Uh, sitting together around the same table. Sure. Remember that uh, the ANC historically was fighting the National Party mm. of Apartheid, right? Mm. Yeah. What happened after 1994? The National Party and the ANC came together. Mm. That was the first unimaginable thing that happened in the yeah. history of, of South Africa. The National Party eventually and officially dissolved into the ANC. Yeah. That's what we tend to forget, by the way. So, a D, and, and by the way, these two parties, by the way, even formed a government of national unity, right? Yeah. So a DA ANC government would actually a repeat of what we have seen before. Mm. And this brings us to the um, uh, accountability aspect. So when such a government um, of opposites take place, yeah. you must expect that these two opposites, number one, don't trust each other. 
Number two, they are not sincere as they get into such a government. They are not sincere. They are plotting to collapse each other. So the ANC, um, when the, it allowed the IFP to collapse into it, yeah. they knew they had a grand strategy eventually to destroy the National Party, and they succeeded. Mm. So the question is, if the ANC and the DA were to come together mm. after 2024 to mm. form a government, which one would destroy the other? Mm. That is the most important question. Would be it the DA eventually destroying the ANC, yeah. or would it be the ANC eventually destroying the DA? Yeah. And that, by the way, that the answer to that question would determine the future of South Africa. Absolutely. But you are right about lack of accountability. Mm. If you want to test your theory, the correctness of your theory, look at what happened to Patricia Delin. Patricia Delin used to be a vocal critic of the ANC, an anti-corruption crusader, mm. right? Have you had Patricia Delin saying anything about Palapala? Quite the contrary. I've actually seen the good party exactly. uh, suddenly changing and apologizing for this Palapala situation. Exactly. So, so if you were to have an arrangement between the ANC and the DA, let me tell you, mm. both of them would keep quiet mm. about embarrassing things that take place in government, even if those things are against the rest of us as a country. Mm. Mm. So I would support uh, the, the third scenario of yeah. opposing parties coming together. Sure. Because if they are four, five, six, it wouldn't be easy for them to, mm. to destroy each other. They would probably have a longer life than what would happen um, in an arrangement that involves two parties. So we've spoken a lot about the immediate politics of the day. But I wanted to come to a question that has been at the forefront of a lot of debates for a slightly longer time, and this is this question of immigration. Last year we saw this big eruption, Operation Dudula, a lot of talk about immigration in our country uh, sliding into a populist rhetoric, uh, a dangerous and a worrying rhetoric, um, but also important questions about what an immigration policy in South Africa today should look like. And I know you're often asked about pressing questions of what's happening now in politics and party politics, but I'm also interested in your perspective on that question of how this issue has arisen and some of your views on the question of immigration in South Africa, uh, xenophobia, xenophobic violence as well, and, and how those interact. Look, the toxic debate about immigration xenophobia and all of that mm. has got to do with what is South Africa's problem generally, which is the collapse of a governing party which sits at the center of the state which leads to the collapse of the state. So immigration is an aspect of governance. So if you look at the state, which is run by the ANC, it cannot fix potholes, it cannot provide electricity, mm. it cannot manage the entry and exit of foreigners into our space. So the problem here, it's not foreigners. Foreigners are not a problem. Any and every civilized country in the world allows foreigners to visit and even to come and work. Um, in that territorial space. And South Africa was built by foreigners who were coming to work and visit here. I mean, Johannesburg brought foreigners from literally all over the world, from Europe, from America, from the rest of Africa. So the entry and exit of foreigners has been part of the making of modern South Africa. What has gone wrong leading to the toxicity of the debate mm. is the failure of the state to manage the entry and exit of foreigners in South Africa. So the, de the debate is misdirected. Yeah. Instead of Operation Dudula, targeting foreigners, it's supposed to go to the union buildings and say, hey, our government, why are you failing to manage the entry and exit of foreigners in South Africa? Mm. That is the biggest problem. So because Operation Dudula and all those who take part in this debate 
are unable to locate the problem. They target wrong people, mm. poor foreigners. By the way, if you look at the problems of South Africa, whether electricity, the collapse of education, potholes, foreigners have got nothing to do with that. It's us, South Africans, mm. and specifically our government failing to manage the state. Well, you know, I think it's always interesting to me when I look at where we turn our violence in this country and, and how there's this desperate and unjust situation in which violence and conflict gets turned on those who are least complicit in the actual problems. Um, and as you say, it, it's, it's worrying to me that we're in a volatile situation where because of the shameful lack of services, because of the economic deprivation, because of the social crises, you know, people often think there's going to be some noble revolution that's going to go to the places of power and, and ask for a more just society. No, it could actually be just a violent, chaotic eruption that doesn't even target the sources of those power. It targets the bystanders and the victims of society's mm -hmm. ills. Um, and that's a really worrying thought for a potential scenario for our country. You see, <coughs> South Africa is a in many ways, a unique country in Africa. If you travel across Africa, you will struggle to find a country with our kind of demographic makeup, where you have a sizable um, portion of whites in Africa, sizable portion of Indians in, in, in South Africa, sizable of blacks living together. So in a way, we are a mirror image of a country like the United States, in a way. That's, that's, our history has produced that. A country like that, it's very difficult and complex to manage mm. because it has got these different people who share the same space. Yeah. Yeah. These different people actually don't come from the same history. They actually don't pay the same allegiance to the same heritage. Mm. As a result, you need the best leadership to manage a society like that. So, in 1994, we had that under Nelson Mandela. He, was, he had such moral power that he could motivate all of us, whites, blacks, Indians, coloreds, all of, all of us. Yeah. We, we believed in the rainbow wisdom that he was selling and in the, in the sincerity of what his government was doing. All of that has fallen apart. When that falls apart, what remains is that different groups withdraw from the center. And when they withdraw, they potentially can cause trouble in different corners of the country. So in South Africa, you won't have a revolution where we are all united against what is happening. What you are going likely to see, you are going to have sporadic uprisings. Um, in different parts of the country, people complaining about different things in different parts of the country. And once you have that, bringing all of these disparate elements together would be very difficult and it would require the best leadership mm. that has a moral force. I am not sure if I am seeing that kind of leadership when I look at South Africa today. Being an outspoken commentator, an analyst, and, and for doing it as, as long as you have, comes with its costs, and we, we often don't speak about those costs. Um, you have to be brave to speak against the government of the day, um, and people see you doing it on TV, maybe they applaud, like I was applauding when I saw one of your recent comments where you uh, took Minister Lamula and others to task right there saying, you know, you don't feel this like other people who aren't in government in those privileged positions. But take us into your own experience of speaking out so vocally um, and some of the costs that come with that and the threats that come with that, that you have to live with when you take the decision that you're going to speak the truth. Look, 
all governments in the world, whether democratic or, or despotic, don't like to be criticized. They don't. Democratic governments may pretend that they are happy uh, with criticism, but they are actually not. Mm. So the ANC government is not different. It does not like to be criticized. And I've been a critic of this government, um, and they have been unhappy with my criticism. They've done a lot of things against me and tried many things. They've tried to recruit me and give me government positions, uh, and I refused. Uh, I told them I'm not looking for a job. Uh, number one, they threatened me. Uh, I was shown a file years ago, an intelligence file. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, a very thick intelligence file, uh, where spies were sent to my village. There was even a theory that I come from Mozambique that they were building up, that they want to deport me. So it was such a problem that you know, this guy's dark in complexion is Shangani, probably come from Mozambique. So they had to go to my village to just check, is this chap a South African? That's one of the things that uh, have happened to me. Wow. So I've been threatened. But you see, I don't see myself as a hero. I'm under no illusion. Uh, I see myself as a patriotic South African. What drives me, number one, is the love of my country. I love this country uh, unreservedly. Uh, number two uh, is the love of my children and their friends. Uh, I have seen many African countries go down to the extent where black people would feel ashamed to be black or they would leave their countries and go to the UK, Germany, and scatter all over the, the world. I've seen that. And I've, I've been fortunate I've traveled the world. I don't want South Africans to get to that point where you must leave this country to go and try and survive. Mm. It's not nice to be a foreigner and, and you are subjected to all manner of ill treatments out there. Mm. So, so, so I... I have a, a patriotic drive that says, let me do my small contribution to try and make sure this country does not collapse because if it collapses, I will have to, to, to leave. Where do I go? I'm black. If you go to Europe, you are going to be subjected to racism. If you go to America, you're going to be subjected to racism. You're not going to find a job. So that's what drives me, um, which is why it doesn't matter the threats. I will not stop critiquing what I think is wrong. I do that in defense of my country, in defense of the future of my children. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, we, we speak about whistleblowers, people who out corruption, but we, we often don't speak about those who share their opinions and, and have to face threats and intimidation. And I didn't even know there was a file. I'm starting to wonder if there's now a file on uh, SMWX. <laughs> we must, we might, we'll share that file if we ever get it. Um, but just in closing as well, I mean, a lot of people who watch this channel are young aspirant political commentators or authors. Um, how have you honed your craft in doing what you do in analyzing politics and then also having the personal confidence to go on TV, to go before cameras and, and to do that? Because again, we do this so often, but we never actually get to talk about the personal side of what it takes and how you actually do it. Okay, the, the, the first thing uh, that landed me where I am uh, was a passion for public intellectualism. I mean, as different human beings, we have different passions. So when I saw uh, public intellectuals engaging, uh, I, 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 I was in awe, you know. Mm. And I said, one day as a young man, I want to be like those people. Uh, and then I went to university, I studied political science. Mm. Uh, and that took me in the direction of think tanks. So I've spent most of my life working for research organizations. Yeah. And when you work for a research organization, what do you do on a daily basis? You do actually three things. You read, you write, and you talk. Mm. So I've spent a lot of time uh, reading, writing, and talking. Yeah. That's what landed me where I am. But what I would like to say to younger people who want to do it is that mm. You really have to invest time in this. 
because I see there are plenty of so-called political analysts, mm. analysts who just wake up in the morning and say, pronounce themselves a political <laughs> analyst. And, 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 and when they analyze, when they stand on that public uh, platform, society wonders, what makes this chap a political analyst? Because he or she is or empty, right? Mm. So you have to invest a lot of time reading so that you ground yourself um, uh, intellectually, sure. which is what I have been doing since I started working on this on this project of becoming a public intellectual. Mm. I read a lot. I mean, if you were to come to my house and see my... The, the most expensive asset, I can say this without uh, fear of contradiction, mm. in my house are my books. So my tables are cheap compared to my books. Mm. My cars are cheap compared to my books. I've invested a lot in books. I buy books mm. to read in order to sharpen my, my mind. So that's how I landed where where I am. So I worked for think tanks. I had a stint as a speech writer for pres former President Tabumbeki, mm. and I've been writing, and the rest is history. Well, thank you so much for sharing your opinions with us. Uh, I finally brought Prince Mashele to SMWX. So at least you know, at least there's some service delivery happening somewhere. Um, thank you so much for joining us on SMWX. It was a real privilege, and hope it's not the last time. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'll come anytime you call me. I hear you.